Good morning, and welcome to Environment Journal's Enviro Exchange webinar series. My name is Corinne Lentz, and I'm the content director here at Actual Media. Today, with support from Aris Environmental Risk Information Services, I'm excited to be hosting this discussion about the evolution of environmental report writing. By now, you probably noticed everyone checking in on the right-hand side with the chat feature. Please say hello. Let us know who you are, where you're from. Uh, us Canadians really do love weather reports. If you want to tell us if it's rainy or sunny there, I can tell you it's a bit overcast in Toronto right now. Right above the chat, you'll see an actual media icon. If you click follow, you'll continue to be updated on our environmental exchange series as new webinars are announced. And down below, you'll see a variety of information. You can see how many people are signed in today's webinar. You'll see the polls feature where we encourage you to cast your votes. And you'll also see a little green button with rotating links to the speaker's websites. So be sure to check those out as well. And most importantly is the ask a question feature. Don't be shy about becoming part of the conversation. I'll do my best to pose your questions to our panelists throughout the discussion. We have an impressive lineup of speakers joining us for this important discussion. But before I jump in and introduce them, I would like to take a few moments to acknowledge the many First Nations and Indigenous peoples of Canada as the original stewards of this great country. I'm here in Toronto, which is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We all share in the responsibility of our natural infrastructure, and there is much we can learn from the traditional knowledge of the land, water, and materials that allow us to build projects that benefit all Canadians. All right, so let's meet our experts. I'm gonna begin by inviting each of our panelists to the screen. Once they're all up on screen, I'll have them spend just a moment introducing themselves and quickly tell us a little bit about who they are, where they're from, and what role, or sorry, what perspective they're bringing to today's discussion. First up, we have Kevin Pendry from SLR Consulting. Good morning, Hi, Kevin. Good morning. And it really is morning for you. I know you're a uh, West. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Next up is Erica Ryder from Stantec. Hi. Good morning. And then we have Dana Wagner from Terracon Consultants. Good morning, Kareem. Good morning. And then last but not least, we have Freezia Waxman from Grounded Engineering. Hello. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Great. Now we've everyone up on the screen. Kevin, will you please lead us off with your intro? Just a bit about your role, where you're from, what perspective you're bringing to the, dis to the discussion today. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm, as Corinne mentioned, I'm Kevin Pandry. I'm from SLR Consulting. I've been selected today to represent the West Coast of North America. It seems that everyone else is really from the east, and I see a few people from Calgary. Perhaps that's about as close to Vancouver as I, I can see. I'm based in Vancouver. Uh, despite so, so despite looking so young, I do I do actually have more than 30 years of, of environmental reporting experience, <coughs> both as a contractor and as a consultant. In my spare time, I, I when I'm not playing golf, I, I manage the land and water team at SLR Consulting across Canada. So our team includes all the site assessment and risk site assessment and remediation people, uh, our risk assessment and toxicologists, and our hydrology and hydrogeology team in 18 offices across Canada. So I, I do a lot of people managing. My work is wide ranging and includes developing and, and, uh, and providing advice on environmental management systems and on environmental management plans, uh, due diligence work and and conducting audits as I happen to also be a, a, a certified environmental consult, uh, auditor. I'm passionate about writing, uh, especially about writing for business. And I'm often called on for senior review, uh, to review or edit or polish reports or proposals. And I use this experience to provide internal courses at SLR, writing courses, where I share a lot of tips and tricks and, and hard lessons learned, and I, and, I, and I share secret writing recipes. That's me. Fantastic. We might get you some work in the magazines over here too. <laughs> All right, Erica, you are up next. Perfect, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Erica Ryder. I'm an environmental engineer and principal at Stantec in our environmental services group. Uh, I'm based out of the Mississauga office uh, today out of my house, home with a sick child. Um, but I've been working in the field of site assessment remediation for about 17 years. Um, with Stantec and uh, previous previous country, uh, company. Um, and I've been really throughout the course of my career heavily involved in report writing in different forms, whether it's for due diligence, portfolios, remediation and spill response, 
or brownfield development. Um, so my current role uh, as a practice leader in our Ontario group, um, one of my focuses is on training and mentoring junior staff, uh, senior review of various environmental reports, and then working with our team locally and, and my colleagues nationally to identify some opportunities for innovation and improvement to report writing process. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, working with junior staff and doing report review was always looking for ways to, um, to get the message across clearly, concisely, um, and efficiently, right? Um, and looking, you know, to to pull in some some new ways of doing things, as as opposed to just sort of doing this, doing the same old and using the same old templates. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Dana. Yeah, thank you again, Dana Wagner. Uh, I am a senior principal and vice president with uh, Terracon Consultants, and uh, in uh, my role at Terracon is uh, I lead the environmental due diligence uh, uh, services group, which is the ESA piece and, and being involved with mergers and acquisitions and um, uh, transactions in general. I also uh, lead the financial, legal and investment sector of national accounts and have been uh, 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 not as uh, uh, not as young looking as Kevin, but or I've been uh, in the business for about 32 years. So I handled uh, and uh, managed uh, literally thousands of projects uh, uh, during that tenure. And um, we, uh, we really take a, uh, at Terracon, we take a very proactive approach to the development of resources because we do have a very large footprint, uh, almost 170 offices and uh, and from a standpoint of those who are involved, in particular in the due diligence side, we have um, several hundred staff who are involved in that process. And so it's a, uh, it does become a very big job. I have a um, practice resource group, which I work with, which again, focuses much what was talked about on, you know, how do we apply innovation? How can we do things more efficiently being as large as we are? and focusing on those aspects uh, of the business. Um, uh, I'm based here in Minneapolis. Uh, it's a uh, weather report, partly cloudy, 67 degrees, about 20 degrees Celsius for, for you guys. Uh, and uh, interests, I, I do skip a curling team here in the Twin Cities. So uh, uh, kudos to my uh, curling uh, brothers and sisters. Perfect. Thank you. Frisia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Frisia Waxman. I'm a senior engineer with Grounded Engineering, and we're based out of Toronto. Relatively young company. I have previously worked for large companies as well. Um, my report writing currently consists of, you know, senior reviews, and I'm working a lot on generating templates at the moment. Um, my Focus recently has been on excess soils and regulation 40619, which is something new that's come into place in Ontario. And other than that, my experience is largely around brownfields, lots of phase ones, phase twos, RCs, risk assessments, get into some hydrogeology, um, ECAs, environmental compliance approvals, and peer reviews. So we're, we run the full gamut here. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. It's going to be one great discussion. I'm not going to waste any time, so we have a limited amount of time today. So I'm going to uh, dive right in with the questions. First off, there are so many different types of environmental reports. So let's start by getting a bit of a lay of the land. What are the most common types of reports that each of you is working on? And, and I'm just going to start top right here with Erica. What are the sure. most common types of reports? Um, for the most part, I mean, phase one and phase two environmental site assessments, um, yep. conceptual site mo models. Um, like Frisia mentioned here in Ontario, there's a lot of work on excess soils, so those types of reports. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then sort of some remediation and peer review reports. So um, generally speaking, things associated with site assessment and remediation, a lot of which is sort of governed by some pretty clear regulations and requirements. Um, but I think those still leave a lot of room for sort of, um, you know, concise report writing and making sure we're sort of telling the story and, and not just sort of, you know, getting the information down on the page. Okay, great. Kevin, how about you? 
Uh, more, more or less the same, but a variety of due diligence reports and I guess and liability assessments and for property transactions and, and for major acquisitions, uh, and then also compliance auditing. I do look at work on quite a few compliance audit reports and remediation planning, and and again, of course, as we all as we all do or we all should, I do a lot of work on proposals. <laughs> yes. I see Dana nodding in agreement a lot here. So uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, much, uh, much uh, the same, uh, the same suite. Phase one and two uh, remedial mm -hmm. action plans. Um, those things that are in support of a transactional environment. Gavin right. mentioned regulatory compliance. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we also, uh, again, because of the, the wide variety of things we do in support of brownfields, redevelopment, there's the grant right. piece. So we assist. Uh, and I've, I've been involved in that significantly. And uh, um, again, the uh, helping the helping the PRG in the practice areas kind of develop, um, you know, the appropriate proposal and report templates and how they function. And we'll talk a little bit further about that uh, here. Mm -hmm. So. Fantastic. And Frisia. Yeah, I mean, there's hardly anything left between everybody <laughs> who's gone before. Um, you, can, you can pick anything. Just, yeah, everything. It's the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, same. It's been well covered. Um, I think, you know, phase ones, the due diligence, especially the ASTM mm -hmm. phase ones, the CSA phase ones, um, those, those are really easy to talk about and pick apart, as well as, uh, you know, litigation, peer review, those type of report fair enough well it, it's a good sign we're on the same page so it should be a good conversation in that sense too so okay so the big question becomes based on those types of reports what are the biggest challenges that you're facing in producing them and I'm, I, I imagine there are you know the problems that seem to keep coming up over and over again um love to hear about those and if you have examples happy to to hear if there's any lessons learned from it as well um would anyone like to st jump in first or i can start pointing at people yeah, I, I can I can jump in on that. So challenges, and I think I, I I alluded to those a little bit, right? When you have a very large practice, what's mm -hmm. really important for our clients, especially we have a very large national account base, right. um, that we're consistent and that we're delivering quality uh, on a timely basis and uh, on budget. So those are the things that we work on constantly and there's i don't think anybody could say we're static we we're set we're doing it um and we don't need to think about it there's a continuous uh, improvement process and that not only goes for um you know standing up the the processes that work but the training and mentoring that goes with that and then application of technology where can we get uh those things that in place that provide that consistency, the standardization, and the efficiency on delivering uh, reports across a, a very large footprint, and of course that boils down to that local um, that local flavor as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's a national firm, local presence. That's really that's really what we uh, what we live by. Awesome. Anyone else like to jump in on there? Challenges that you're facing. Yeah, I, I think similar similar to that, um, you know, understanding, you know, a lot of the reports we're talking about, it's a pretty set framework, right? But sort of understanding how the client is using those reports and, and how, you know, so that we can understand going into it, um, how we're framing the outcomes and the conclusions. And I think similar to Dana's point from a consistency perspective, right, especially when you're working on portfolios or with national clients, right? How are you presenting that information, um, doing it in a consistent manner, but it also in a manner that's adding value, right? Like we're consultants, we're here to provide that interpretation and that advice and really understanding how the client's using that information. And, and I think, you know, providing that guidance and, and mentorship to the staff doing the reporting as well to sort of, you know, take it upon themselves to synthesize the information and, and sort of tell that story. Kevin, Frizia? Yeah. I think, um, you know, getting junior staff up to speed is always a pain, a pain point in our report writing. Um, it takes time and that's where the importance of uh, quality senior review always comes in and is, 
you know, invaluable. Um, and onto that, I think canned wording, you know, the typical conclusions, uh, we need to make sure that you do a reality check sometimes and see if um, the conclusions that you're drawing on a report are, are going to actually make sense in the real world. Um, have you had a hard time? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Some, yeah, sorry, some, <laughs> for me, for me, the for me, pain points that, that that probably probably no one else has ever experienced. Ha ha ha! Is is actually having when you, especially when you have a more complex report, uh, and that's having a third party or 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 mm -hmm. or a member of your team hold everyone else back by not sticking to a schedule, because uh, that's that's probably the, the biggest pain point because it's very difficult to get everything to flow together and. And, to, and to, to check your facts against different sections and different, you know, especially if it's a multidisciplinary report. Uh, so I think that's, yeah, you know, to avoid handing in a disjointed report or pulling your hair out at the last second because you only have 20 minutes before the thing has to go out the door. Uh, I think you really, the, the, the biggest thing there is you, you really need a hard taskmaster and somebody who's, you know, unfortunately it's not a popularity contest. Uh, <laughs> it will be popular because it, everyone will be successful, but they really need, it really needs planning. Huh? I think probably a little bit later in the session, you know, that that's probably one of my main themes that I do talk about is is, is how to do some of the planning and and when to do it. So I think that's the pain point is 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 actually dealing and, and actually as we go on, it's you know it's a, it's a, as we all know it's hard to retain staff in, in some in this kind of climate and uh, you can't really be you can't be the hard taskmaster or disciplinarian right now. So that is a pain point is, is trying to get people to actually focus and, and get things delivered on on schedule. Yeah, Corrine, and I, I will add one thing and just to, because I do think it's important, kind of an overall um, theme here, and Erica touched on it. Um, the report is a deliverable. We're consulting for our clients. We always need to keep that in mind as we're preparing this deliverable in support of their deal. Uh, that's mm -hmm. very important. And uh, it was, you know, Frisia mentioned it with junior staff, in particular with junior staff. They're just getting going. It's very important to drive home this idea. This is why we're doing this. It's not just to create this report. Right. Well, and I think on that point too, having that having that discussion early on in the report writing process, right? Because what you you know you don't want to be looking at it the day before it's due to the client and realize we've got some issues or some, some things that haven't been communicated to them, right? So just yeah, making sure that there's I mean everything's communication, right? But but at the onset with the staff involved and, and just really mm -hmm. making sure you're having those discussions and sort of working through the issues as they come up. Yeah, it's a, it's a common theme in all of the webinars and discussions we've been having recently about obviously finding, attracting and retaining great staff, especially skilled in the environment industry. It's a bit of been a challenge. So um, it's interesting to me that that's come up here pretty early on in this discussion too. All right, what I wanna do really quickly is remind the audience right now, that little word down at the bottom says polls. If you click on that right now and open up the box, what I'm keen to find out is just this first question here. So we have an understanding of who we're chatting with today. So are you directly responsible for produ producing environmental reports? Yes, no, occasionally. If you haven't already, jump in there and, and we'd love to see your votes. Um, looking pretty st strong right now that the majority of our audience is yes, they're directly responsible for producing environmental reports. So it looks like we have absolutely the right crowd. And, 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 and do, you have, do you have a question that says, do you have a question that says, how many do a really good job at it? And yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's something you can drop in the chat there. So how many of you do a really great job writing reports? If you look at these numbers going up, this is pretty amazing. So lots of people online here. So great, this is, thank you for that, everybody. All right, so I am gonna jump into the next series, of, the next question. So the question I have for you guys is, has environmental report writing evolved over the years? Are we doing things differently now that we, we were 10 years ago? Um, love to get your perspective on this. And then I think we will also talk about the future uh, and the technology side of it as well. But right now I'd like to see, and a few of you here have been in this for, you know, looking young as you do for 30 years. So maybe you can talk about over that 30 year span rather than just 10, but uh, nothing, love nothing, to hear how we've seen nothing it. Nothing changed. Nothing Kevin, changed. do you want to try and knock that one out? <laughs> nothing changes. It just gets better and better. Yeah. Oh, okay. And everyone that's coming out of school is brighter and brighter. So yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think Erica mentioned like, and, and Fija both talked about templates and things and I think that's one of, that's one of the things that's changing so I would say that over 
over the decades, uh, there certainly has been more of a trend towards using templates, which which has its its its, its good points and and has, it is good for efficiency and but it does, sometimes does beat the creativity out of people. But you know it is it is a necessary evil, uh, and you know obviously it, it's something that 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 companies need to have these days to be efficient. So I think I think that's something we you know that jumps right to mind is this whole idea of templates. And then the second thing would be that just one of the key things that has that's changed over the years is that. Previously, we, we used paper copies of everything, and that's the, that's the reality. And uh, and now uh, we, we've we've come leaps and bounds ahead, and we're now working on reports at the same time. And as you actually edit a, a paragraph, you look behind you, and someone else is ch is changing the paragraph you just changed. So there's lots of things where you have to work. So it's it's many hands make the, make easy work, but you know they also complicate things. So I think th those are many things that are, that are changing. We can go on. And, I'll let the rest of the panel go, but you know, automation, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, uh, absolutely the case. Uh, back in the day, um, paper, um, I will confess, uh, film <laughs> that you had to get developed and plowed in. Uh, so all of us are familiar with that, but it's evolved significantly just as technology has, right? Um, mm -hmm. your, your life is literally held in your... Uh, in the palm of your hand in many respects, your communication device, your um, documents, uh, the photos, um, and that has really allowed for, um, you know, really some more better efficiency, certainly from a standpoint of the turnaround times that one would usually expect for reporting. So that's gone down the expectations there. Hey, let's get this done. And it, it is really a terrific tool to do that because you can, you can interact with people in the field as, as questions arise and hopefully you can nip things in the bud before they get, you know, much to Erica's point, when you see a report that's, you know, hey, you missed something here, we need to get on it. Um, and again, we're going to talk a little bit, I think, about technology later, but that, I think, has been uh, the biggest thing uh, from the standpoint of efficiency and really better products in in many respects sure i think there's a yeah, um, group happening in the chat right now <laughs> from past experience <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i'll go next i'll just say that uh in looking for efficiencies i know that at least some of the larger companies have started recently to um outsource their either their reporting or their background review or the drafting that goes along with the reporting um, to different countries. And there's obviously lots of pros and cons with that. Um, the driving force being that it's cheaper, generally speaking. Um, and with all the technological advances, you know, we're living in the digital era. Should it really matter that uh, where somebody's physically located with COVID, I think we've all realized that to a large extent, it probably doesn't. Um, the resource is the brain in this case, but um, we're also starting to look at more ESG and environmental, right? So environmental social governance issues. Um, so what's, what's important? Is supporting your local economy important? Are we all one big global community now? Um, there's, there's lots of questions around that and if for those larger companies that are moving in that direction, I would just say, don't exploit anyone, pay them better than what they would make in their home country. Um, be aware of their cultural needs and issues and their time zone and make them a part of your team. So that's one way that the report writing seems to be going. That's interesting. All right. Well, and I think like sort of even from a local level, just over the last two years, the change from something like a platform like this or using Teams and using SharePoint. I mean, um, just the, I think uh, whether it was Kevin or Dana mentioned seeing somebody sort of working on the same report at you at the same time. And I think that's made a big difference. Um, you know, we have staff in my group that sit in a bunch of different offices in Ontario. And so it doesn't, you know, the field work has to physically be done, but then the reporting can be shared by people across offices and it allows right you to pick the right person or give give somebody an opportunity sort of independent of their geography there too yeah and i I'll, I'll add one thing and, and this is just a take off of what Risa was alluding to that um i i agree that that we've seen uh um this idea of 
kind of offshoring preparation. I, I guess the one admonition there is um, it, it is very important to have somebody who understands the local practices and customs and, re and more importantly, the regulations that would apply so that you're giving your best advice to the client. Now, um, that, uh, you know, hopefully there is somebody in that chain who's doing that, but that becomes a very important issue. I can't tell you how many times where that local knowledge has come into play in ascertaining if something is wheat or is it chaff, right? So that is one thing that I think uh, we want to keep in mind. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we chat about international experience. All right, we have a question from the audience and it's kind of rolls right into what I was going to ask next anyway, which is what are the innovations that are helping out to streamline the port production process? And, you know, what some of those technologies are helping to address some of the challenges we mentioned earlier. And I would love to hear from our panelists if there is some new tech or online resource that you subscribe to or find interesting that you'd like to talk about. I would love to hear it as well. So um, and we did have a question specifically about software in there. So. I think that's a perfect fit. So who wants to jump in on innovation there? Well, I can, I, I noticed a, a bunch of people talking in the chat about days yeah. spent in the library doing city directory searches <laughs> and pulling your photos. So I, I do think that is, um, that is a big change that, you know, I've noticed over the last number of years is, is the ability to get that information electronically. Um, right. You know, we use ARIS for a lot of that information here in Ontario. So you get your air photos, you get your city directory searches, your fire insurance plan, and with the tools where you can sort of overlay those on GIS maps and see everything and sort of switch seamlessly between them as opposed to taking the bits and pieces of the fire insurance plan and taping them all together in a big photocopy. Um, and I think that's made a big difference that that really has helped sort of be able to see all the data together and synthesize things. Um, and the other is, you know, electronic collection of data in the field makes a big difference. So to pull that information um, you know, straight into straight into the databases that you're managing reduces the transcription errors, et cetera, right? And I think um, that that has also made a big difference at being able to manage a lot more data in in real time. You know, be able to see from the office where staff are, what they're seeing, what the photos are. Yeah, I <clears throat> I would uh, I would absolutely agree with that. And uh, having spent those days in the catacombs. Um, looking for historic resources, um, it's it's evolved. It's uh, we're in a different uh, we're a totally different universe, frankly, from a standpoint of where it was. And honestly, that's driven, uh, you know, our sponsor today, Eris, the fact that they have been working on uh, delivering more data, understanding the need, and and having tools that can allow uh, folks to uh, interact with it. And that's a that can be a really big deal. The GIS was mentioned, I agree, Erica, that that is a really big deal. When you're telling a story, we have, um, you know, just a, a couple of things. Uh, we have uh, this client portal uh, that we use um, in conveying uh, information to clients as part of a progress call or a kickoff call. And it's allowing one to essentially present this information in an interactive way to tell a story, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. When you can line up a site plan, click on photos, bring up the photos. When you can bring in Sanborn maps as an overlay to say, here's the issue. You have the topo map, here's groundwater flow based on everything we know. It tells an impactful story for the client. A lot of times it, it moves it from two dimensional to three dimensional and people are able to grasp it sooner. And it's those things are terrific uh, tools of communication. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think, um, you know, almost every company probably has their own, um, whether it's in Google Earth or some other database of projects that you've already worked on. So we have our own databases of historical information on all the reports that we've done, the analytical results from nearby properties. So um, that's really evolved. And, uh, you know, if we all put our databases together, we might have the whole, <laughs> the whole area covered, but um, at least we have a lot better information at our fingertips now that way. Yeah, the, the use of things like Equus and, and SDAT are, have made a, a huge difference. So 
synthesizing data and you can look at data trends very quickly. So that's, if, if anyone hasn't got those, I mean, they, they can look them up, just look it up, <laughs> look it up on the web. Um, that's another technology, the web I've heard, I've heard it's, it's gonna be catching on pretty soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I rumor think that's has it, right? Rumor yeah. has it, yeah. <laughs> but there is also, I mean, I guess for, for in, on the innovation side, kind of the thing. I think, I mean, companies like ours, we're we, we you know, what we didn't have years ago it was you know a document control team, and, and now you know we have a document control team, and we have style guides and, and those sort of things that are you know kind of critical or to, to, to getting a bit more effective, and they also help when there's you know. And there's some disagreements about what the way you should do it, which is the way, the right way to do something, or what is the right wording to use. Sometimes the style guides and that sort of thing help out. And then, yeah, and that quick tip before I forget is like when there are two right answers, remember that the right, the rightest answer is the shortest answer. So the shortest <laughs> one is the one that should win every time. Agreed. <laughs> All right, we have um, questions rolling in from our audience here too. So I'm going to jump in and squeeze one of those in right now. Are any of you using automated or on the field generated reporting systems, auto generated from the field? Is our first question here. Anyone? <laughs> I'm not at right now. We were previously um, starting to try it. Um, it it's, it's in the works, I would say. Yeah, I'd say we, we, we have you we have used it and with mixed results too. it's just you know mm -hmm. if you're in a real tailored thing we, we've actually even designed our own programs to do that um, yeah. and for some case in some cases it does work other cases you know you almost but for the for the few hours you might save uh, it, it hasn't proved that worthwhile yet but it's certainly yeah. I mean the strange thing is I know you know 20 years ago or more than more than 20 years ago I worked at I worked a little bit on some old uranium mines in in the US and uh, I remember then there was a, there was software that you could actually do an ASTM phase one and you could it would just spit it out and that's 25 years ago and, it's, and it just <laughs> amazes me that you know you start to rewrite the whole thing again but it amazes me that in all this time there is still not something where you just basically speak into a computer press a button and, and, and it'll just it'll just pop out I think I think that time is coming so the, the artificial intelligence is getting better and I think you are we're probably going to end up you know in, a, in, a, in the future we will be we won't be typing we'll be talking to our computer and uh or whatever the thing is called at that time but it'll 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 spit out a document for us so um good it's, yeah. that's good and bad so still we, need we, that yeah. critical judgment yeah, yeah right yeah. right exactly uh we yeah, i don't i don't think you can necessarily take the human out of it especially when there comes to judgment calls i mean ai has uh, certainly will get to a point where it'll give you a a pretty good answer, but it's hard for it to read, you know, the client and, and filter information. Yeah, I think just, uh, for, just, just for the simple, the, sim the simple task, I think it's just going to speed yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. You slip, you slip through the interpretation. And, and, and yep, yeah. absolutely. Um, so we, uh, we have a field app. Um, one of the, one of the issues, of course, uh, and this is a practical concern relative to when you, when you stand up um, applications like this, you have to support them and you know when you have a mobile application you have you know the android and you have the apple ios and it that has to be supported and so that can be challenging especially when um there's they're constantly upgrading those systems so you find yourself you know trying to keep up with that um and and we did it, it was a system where it is a system that can import directly into our writing platform which is uh, we've had for a number of years called teradox and uh it's a word plugin um so in that regard it's you know easy to edit once you get it downloaded and that type of thing um but again much like kevin pointed out it's you know you have the inputs but you have to work on it make sure that everything there's no transcription everything is where it needs to be um and i i think uh you know that certainly uh is going to continue to be part of the part of the um the issue yeah i think there's certain aspects of different types of reports that are easy to you know pull the data from the field right into tables or right into um maybe some of the more general sections of the report right i know we're you know sort of looking at that as well from a from a phase one even, right? Like from a field data collection and, and how, how much of that can you pre-populate and how much is worth pre-populating because then you know how you how you go through and, and provide that that discussion. 
Um, so yeah, I, to me, I think it's, th there's a certain level you get to where that, you know, you're not writing the same thing on your notes in the report and, and vice versa, but then, you know, there's always going to be the requirement to write some of it and provide the interpretation. The, the one thing I, I, I do, and I, I know we're talking about uh, primarily environmental reports, but one thing on property condition assessments, as a for instance, or FCAs, there is more of maybe of a direct translation. You know, you're entering, you know, hard data, numbers, uh, metrics, and those are basically being imported in and presented in a, in a form. So there are report types that are more conducive to that than others. Yeah, you're right. Like annual monitoring reports, that type of a thing would be good. Yeah. All right. Each of you, or each of our panelists, and say you guys, uh, bring a unique perspective to this conversation. So I've got some specific questions lined up for you. Um, we have lots of questions showing up everywhere right now. So I'm going to go through these ones and maybe we can go a little bit quickly through these and we'll have some time hopefully to get some more questions from our audience. So Kevin, I'm picking on you first. With your experience in developing and providing implementation advice for environmental management programs, I think you're often called upon to provide senior review and editing for reports. Do you notice any recurring themes? Do you have tips to offer for environmental report writers? And I know there was a question from someone who was asking about new environmental report writers too, so maybe there's two levels there. Yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely noticed some. I've, I've noticed quite a few recurring themes and I have zillions of tips that I can share. I'll share. I'll share a few. <laughs> I'll share a few in the next in the next minute or two, uh, and I and I can go on and on. So don't get don't get me started. I, I can. I will connect you with Connie Vitello, the editor of Environment Journal, and she'll be expecting a you know feature article and all those terms. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so you know, I'll, I'll talk about one one to three, and then you, you can cut me off when you when you when you, when, you, <laughs> when you when you start feeling too smart or whatever. But you know, okay. I, I guess the, the theme that I've noticed that a recurring theme is 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 that. And as much as we, that, that we get automated and we go to a digital world or whatever, there's still the key thing in, or one of the most important things that people can really pay attention to is that report writing is, is unless, it's, unless you're doing a one paragraph report, it really is a team sport. So for all of those, I know somebody meant Dana earlier was talking about curling, but you know, we're, we're in the hockey playoffs right now. So the, 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 theme, the, the theme now is, is you need to work as a team uh, and find out where the actual goal is and to, to be able to score something. So uh, that has changed it all. So it's it's amazing that over 20 years, the key thing that keeps popping up is that when report writers experience pure joy and get to dance around their living rooms at night, uh, it's almost always because they did some planning of their reports and because they got the buy-in from the senior reviewer and when they're lucky enough, they got the buy-in from the client before they ever started doing any writing. So that's a, that's a recurring thing. So almost always it's because they have some planning and they do get the buy-in from the senior review beforehand. Uh, the second thing is that it's also equally true that the biggest failures and the most anxiety and the most depressing times uh, for people on major reports, most often is linked to a lack of planning and a, and a lack of checking in before you start writing. So uh, having, a, you know, and, and not getting a buy-in from the senior review or the client beforehand. So having a writer pour their heart out, heart and soul into some kind of report, and they, you know, they 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 develop a 15-page masterpiece, and then they they then they hand it in to the senior reviewer with a big smile, and the senior reviewer takes it away, and they come back and they say, you know what, this is terrific, but I was really expecting just a two-page summary, and you know that's that's actually really really tough on the senior reviewer too, uh, and it's devastating and frustrating for the for the poor person. Uh, who has to, to get that kind of feedback. So the real tip there is that writers should always get agreement from their senior reviewer and before the client if possible, before they start writing. So simple things like how many pages are you expecting? I mean, I know it sounds like a really corny thing to say, but it really, that is a, that puts things in perspective and people get a quick idea. Are there any tables? Should I put tables in the back? Should I put drawings in the front? What should I do? Do you have an outline? And then for the senior, the tip for senior reviewers is, don't agree to be the senior reviewer unless you get to actually chime in before the report gets started. So whenever, I know that's not always possible, that's, that's the kind of more the ideal world, but that is something that I think is, is an absolute critical thing. So if you're writing a report today, before you put pen and paper, talk to whoever's going to be reviewing it and say, this is what I'm going to be doing, because when you go to them, either you win together or you lose together. Sometimes you draw, 
but mostly you want to work. So that's that's one thing. Then, then the other the other quick trend that I have is is that you know despite this kind of opposing trend where reports are, are, are that are that are required to satisfy regulators, they are becoming more and more detailed and prescriptive, uh, which necess necessitates the use of templates to become effective. However, you know reports to satisfy most businesses. If they're done properly, in, in my belief, is is that they are getting shorter and sweeter and easier to understand. Because I find that clients are increasingly, you know, wanting to have a focused focused report that actually just summarizes the key points. They don't require boatloads of detail, and um, you know, sadly, most of them don't have scientific backgrounds, and they and they don't have a very, you know, <laughs> I'm not cutting up clients, but they don't have that much of an attention span. They want to know what. What what do I need to do? You know, am I going to jail? Should I run for the hills? Just give, <laughs> give me give me the news first. So uh, we need to get their attention. So the biggest tip there is, no matter where you are in a report, in whatever section, if you can summarize the key findings first in one sentence or two sentences before you write anything, then do it. That is the absolute takeaway thing that you should should always remember. People don't need the details and the rationale as much as you think they do, and and any background information. It's kind of the word kind of gives it to you. It's background information. Put it in the back if you have to put it in at all. And then finally, and then I'll then I'll then I'll stop because I know there's a lot of the panel has a lot of other tips. Is that, is that you know, I have noticed the other theme, especially with our bright bright people coming out of university in the last few years, is that engineers and scientists like to show uh, that they're smart, and they often and they often do so, and they and they write to impress their their supervisor, and they write to impress their peers. I think Dana mentioned it before. You, you kind of have to. You, you're not really thinking of the audience. Who is going to be the key, the key audience on this thing? So, and then, and when they're writing things, they often write a lot of non-relevant information. So it's the kind of thing that I'm kind of, kind of known for. Is about. It's, it's amazing what can be edited out, and when you ask the question, so what? So that's my big. <laughs> so what? If you look at it and you ask the question, so what? And it's not answered, and either you should rewrite that paragraph or you should delete it. That's that's the answer. So a true story. I used to have, and I inherited it from my father, a rubber stamp that had a so what <laughs> word on it, and I would stamp the report. And and it, and, it'd be, and I guess I guess it was probably funny, but after about the fifth time, then people kind of you know, okay, I'm tired of the so what stamp. But at least it got the message across, and people got to think about it. So it frustrates me now that we have electronic reports and I can't actually put so I have to type so I have to type and so on. I really using that stamp. So use use that idea and and and, and rewrite re reread your work and then ask the question so what if it doesn't if there's if there's no real answer consider rewriting clarifying or deleting and that that's that's just a couple of, that's that's three I've only got a million other tips to go. <laughs> awesome, I want to see that article. Uh, okay, Dana. Given your international experience in transactional oriented environmental due diligence, what can you tell us about navigating report writing in North America versus other places? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things on that. And uh, uh, so from a standpoint of, you know, what goes on here in the U.S. where I'm based, of course, uh, due diligence uh, is really driven by the regulation, right? The Superfund regulation, this all appropriate inquiry, avoiding the liability, if at all possible. Um, and it's also driven by um, commercial lending that really had a big influence uh, on uh, phase ones really, uh, really kind of taking off as part of that customary practice when it comes to real estate transactions. So I think that's an important uh, background to understand when you're looking at other countries. Uh, Canada, I think, is a you know, very close uh, analog, right? They have, you have a standard uh, and, but their liability laws are different, right? It's not, you're not necessarily doing a official, you're not doing this necessarily to avoid uh, a um, national liability like we have here in, in the States, but you are needing to understand what's going on uh, relative to your property and environmental uh, contamination and the, the, the prospect of it. Um, Mexico, uh, certainly different. There's there's laws on the books that are actually fairly onerous. Uh, however, again, the liability scheme is different and much what was driving work there was this the concept of maquiladora, right? And so you had US companies 
uh, moving businesses there, and there was that um, bringing with them the what they are familiar with, right? Hey, we want to do an ASTM phase one here. Well, we can we can be consistent, but there are limitations, and those have to be explained uh, to the client as you're as you're moving about uh, Europe. Um, again, uh, very same thing. The kind of the the whole idea of the, the liability schema is different, and they have. Uh, I, I will say there are some countries that are very much set up to um, provide information that can be used to give you more of an ASTM type uh, phase one. Um, but again, it's absolutely hit or miss. I think one of the and again, this this applies also to, to Asia. Um, very intense laws on the books. They may be not necessarily applied um, across the board, as it were. The key, I think, takeaway for anybody who's doing work internationally is it's very, very important to have a um, a very key understanding of the regulations and the practices in that area. So uh, we partner. Um, with uh, other providers, frankly, when when needed to basically provide that. Now, a lot of times our clients, they want us involved, you know, national firm, they're doing work in, well, they're doing work internationally and they're they're making acqu acquisitions and we, you know, help advise, but we also bring in partners to provide that um, the the, what the, the state of play is in that locale, because it's, it's absolutely critical. I don't think anybody should, you know, say they're going to be doing work in a particular country when they have no experience there. It's just, it's a, it's a liability waiting to happen. You really want to provide the best advice to your client and get the best team together. You know, Kevin mentioned the, the team in the company when you're doing a report, same thing applies internationally. Make sure you have a good team and, uh, and you 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 can uh, you can move ahead with that kind of work. Great, thank you. All right, Erica, as a licensed engineer with a qualified person and a qualified person, not with a qualified person, uh, we'll call you QP. I don't know why I went so formal there. For ESAs, you provide strategic advice to clients to help them navigate the regulatory framework and manage their environmental liabilities. Do you have examples you can share with us of effective strategies that you employ? Um, yeah, I think so, you know, in dealing with more complex sites or sort of understanding where they're going down the road, right? So in Ontario, a lot of that is record of site condition. So what's going to be the expectation um, of the ministry when they're looking at those documents is really understanding how you're going to use the data, right? Because it's such an iterative process. Like you go out, you do your phase one, you find your areas of concern. You go out, you do your sampling, you bring that data in. Okay, great. We've got some issues. Let's go back out. And you're, and you're back and forth and back and forth. And often with the regulating, with the regulators, or if there's a third party peer review, maybe there's some additional investigation that happens along the way. Um, and so I think, you know, we're using us, we use an Equus database, like understanding how that information is going to, you know, enter into the database and then how you're going to use it so that you can plan your investigations to take advantage of that, right? So that you're not sort of all of a sudden struggling to incorporate new data into these ever growing tables and figures and data sets. Um, so, I mean, Kevin talked about it as well, right? Really the planning up front, like how is this information gonna be used? How do you see it playing out? And of course things are gonna change, um, you know, your approach and your findings may change along the way, but really thinking through how we're gonna wanna present that information, how you're gonna tell the story and then making sure that as you're collecting the information, as you're managing the data, it's, it's, it's in a way that that you can use it and manipulate it without a lot of rework and a lot of, you know, painful effort along the way. Because of course, too, from a, you know, a client's perspective, time is money um, and the crunch always comes at the end. The report is due and suddenly you found errors in the data set. So the more you can kind of manage that up front, um, you know, not that you can manage that effort and, and try to avoid those those last minute headaches and, and extra effort that at that point you probably don't have budget for anyways. I have to tell you, there seems to be a lot of commonalities between report writing and journalism. I think my <laughs> professor had a so what stamp as well. I had that written on my stuff. So a, a lot of deadlines. <laughs> yeah, I think we all could 
could have drinks together. On but it's a great trip. question, right? It like, is, yeah. why is this important? And if it is important, you should be able to clearly present that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Frisia, with your responsibilities as a peer reviewer for a large environmental organization, can you walk us through how you provide guidance on environmental re remediation and brownfield deployment projects? Sure. <laughs> so, the, yeah, I mean, the peer reviews that are typically from the litigation realm, um, when you're doing those, I think it's especially important to uh, keep in mind that you are reviewing someone else's work. You know, this is another professional. So you don't focus on the little things, the grammatical errors, unless it changes the meaning of the sentence or the conclusion. Um, I, I don't see that as being relevant or important. We all make typos. Um, but, you know, also recognizing that it's generally much easier to pick apart someone's work when you're looking down from 10,000 feet um, than when you're on the ground managing all of the, the aspects of, as Eric was saying, you know, that iterative process of a remediation or, or whatever the project is. Um, and as far as you know, how I go about it, I, I kind of uh, do a general once over of the of the report and then try and put my comments into sections about, you know, are there any game stoppers? Is this a, a major technical flaw? Or, you know, these are things that need clarification. And then if there's any minor things, you know, if it's a report that I only have minor things to say on, then so what, as Kevin said. <laughs> I say a lot of other things too, by the way. <laughs> That's the only one we're going to remember. So much for this. <laughs> but there are probably children listening into this. <laughs> we're renaming this webinar to So What? Love it. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions, and I'm looking through, and it you know, keeps getting voted over and over. So we, I think we must have some, you know, more junior uh, environmental writers in, in our audience today. So what strategies would you recommend for a junior staff member who's learning to write professional environmental reports for the first time? Um, I know we got some stuff a little bit already, but do you have any other comments you'd like to add to that? Dana's yeah. nodding. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think, uh, you know, Kevin really, really hit on the, the key elements. Uh, and I do think the you know, there's this idea of a kickoff call, hugely important, right? You set the stage for what's going to be done, what needs to be done. And giving them that perspective, I think can be very, very helpful. Um, also, uh, we, have, we have here an authorized project reviewer process, which again, assures uh, uh, that quality is there, but also there's that mentoring component with, with younger staff and that is hugely important uh again uh, what was noted um you know brevity right can you get your point across without you know spending pages and pages and pages and in particular telling the story right having <clears throat> having a report with a bunch of disparate elements that are not tied together from a standpoint of presenting um it's essentially this conceptual site model for the site on a on an ESA basis is problematic. And so you really want to have that kind of focus. How does this relate to that? And what kind of things do you need to be focusing on to get you to uh, that point? Um, the last thing is, um, you know, sometimes it's uh, uh, repetition. Just get in there, start doing it, but make sure you do have that that kickoff call, make sure you do have that mentoring piece of it. It's it's hugely important to know that they're not on an island. They feel they're not on an island, they're part of a team and 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 working together that way. I think there was a there was a good comment in the chat too, just about reading some reports written by others. So before you get started, ask for a few examples of you know what's you know a similar report or a similar complexity that was well done and, and what are you looking for? Um, and then, yeah, when you go through that senior review process, you know, you're going to get the edits back. You're going to get the chat changes and just ask for some time for the person who did that review to sit down and go through the, so what of their comments, right? Like why, why are you changing these things? Is it a liability issue? Is it a flow issue to just understand where those revisions and comments are coming from too helps. 
Yeah, I think I think I think yeah. now it's, it's it's more important than ever now with people being you know away from offices for for a few years or whatever. I think a lot of it. I think we risk as reviewers we risk demotivating people because they know they don't actually get the context of even when you put in the review comments. So I think that's when key thing I know you can pick up that old fashioned thing called the telephone and actually call somebody and actually talk to them at least it's it's better than it's better than just text comments. I know I, I know I need to do more of that. <laughs> we all do. Uh, yeah. but yeah that so so I, I guess from the from the writer's perspective then especially if you're a junior, yeah. Don't be shy. Call 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 the call the reviewer. They'll be happy. They should be happy to help you. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. has to be there, right? Yeah. No stupid questions. And if you do your initial project kickoff, you know, report on a page, here's what we expect to see and you're going through and you're doing this report and you find in the background somewhere that there's a red flag, don't just sit on it and put it in the report immediately. Let them know, let your senior reviewer know um flag it early yeah win yeah. together share the blame <laughs> yes yeah. and i think carrie in the comments also said uh uh what she sees is that um there's a disconnect between what junior staff sometimes put on the page and what's in their head so mm -hmm. making sure that as carrie said that you connect those thoughts and those dots in the report i think somebody else mentioned it earlier too the idea of rereading I, it's remarkable, right? You're going through your, your little <clears throat> section and you go, boom, it's done. And then you're moving on. And again, going back and just, even if it's a, um, just a little bit of a breeze through, but just rereading it is hugely important because you'll see things that go, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Or nope, I did not tie that down the way it needed to be. I think that would be um, one of the hacks that Kevin referred to is just to take that you know, 15 minutes, you wrote it. So hopefully it'll be a lot easier, but just rereading it makes, I think a big difference. And, and do, do yourself a favor, get no matter what you, what, whenever, whenever possible, and it should almost be every time, you know, if you're going to be consistent, just make sure that somebody else actually does, does look at it because we're all human and we all make mistakes and, and you don't want to have a fatal flaw going out. And every now and then it's just nice. You, you like things to be perfect and somebody else reads it and they, they catch one thing good for good for them and it's kind of like it's almost like a game you know we're yeah. going to do with each other you got damn record something <laughs> yeah. it's, almost, it's almost impossible you can always change something but you, sh you should always you should get it peer reviewed at least i mean i think that's 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 a key point as well if you go out rogue it's you know not only is it a liability but, it's, but sometimes you'll you'll re you, you'll regret it i think most things mm -hmm. i've regretted is, is things that i actually didn't get checked again and then i was you know yeah, that, that's the only I made one yeah. mistake out of 10,000 10, 10, reports. <laughs> and that's because wow. I didn't get it checked. <laughs> and I don't know if you're going to bring this up or not, but, you know, words that we didn't want to include. Yeah, that's we'll the perfect lead in. Oh, we yeah. are. <laughs> we're just about down to our last couple of minutes. So what I'm going to do is final thoughts from each of you is we'll have, um, we'll go around and yeah, we all know that language, especially an environmental report can be pretty tricky. Any advice on words or language not to use? And I'll give you kind of both like a minute each to, to round it up and freeze it. I think you should start that now. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll take the easy one. All. Yeah. We don't, we don't like to say <laughs> yeah. all or, you know, anything that's really conclusive when it, it shouldn't be when it, there's uncertainty. So everything, all words like that. Well, there's a yeah. bunch, so I'll let the other panelists. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, uh, using absolute language, leave that to the politicians. Uh, um, uh, but the fact is, you know, any, all, you know, never those declare those declaratives, those should, those should be avoided always. I mean, it, there you go. Um, <laughs> it always. Craig agrees. <laughs> no, pun, no pun intended. Um, so it's, uh, again, that, that is really critical, um, especially, you know, those of us, and I think everyone on this call has probably participated in um, expert witness uh, testimony, and, and those are the things that they hone in on. It's like, well, you, of course you covered it. It says right here, all things were reviewed. Um, so again, it's, it's really important to, uh, to stay away from that. Um, the, the other thing, too, I, I think it's important uh, that senior review, that's, 
that really is something I think that can help with that mentoring. And that should be, again, agreed with Kevin that that's a requirement uh, before stuff goes out the door to make sure that these things are avoided. Yeah, so, you, so you should ins you should ensure that you get that you get senior review, but you shouldn't use the word ensure in a report. So we all <laughs> like it. It's a fantastic. That's an appropriate. Word. It's a nice, use it's a nice word, word to use. It, it, it reads so beautifully, but if you're ever going to nail down, you you know you ensured it, so you're basically guaranteeing it. So you know. yeah, anyway, we, we we've all talked about that, but you know something. The truth is that in all the years, everybody's always talked about don't say ensure. I've never ever heard of one court case where everybody has ever talked about that, but it's we we all like to talk about it. So don't say ensure. <laughs> yeah. You know. Anyway, don't, try not to use ensure because somebody else will criticize you rightly or wrongly, so they will. <laughs> and another one of my favorites which is probably is is using the word determine so it's mm -hmm. funny how we determine all these things but it's actually we don't actually determine things it's only if if you believe in god or something then god determines things like we, we mortals only just assess things so uh, maybe keep that in mind so the next time you say we determined that the site was contaminated you didn't determine it so somebody else could so Right. Yeah, especially with the numerical models, you know, we determined, mm -hmm. no, you estimated. You estimated. Yeah. This model. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And, Erica, uh, do you have any uh, keywords that you would like to add to the list of never use? I think we've covered all the big ones, but I think really it's, you know, further to Frisha's point there, right, that your conclusion, you know, based on these lines of evidence or, right, like just sort of <laughs> tying that in, like what what are you using to form that opinion and just making that very clear and and then your limitations as well right and making sure that those are very clearly laid out what areas weren't accessible what what sort of things challenged um completion of the work thank you we are out of time thank you to all of our panelists today and thank you to our attendees as well your participation through the chat feature and my goodness that's been busy today and your poll and the response to the poll questions they really make a big difference in making these virtual events um feel more of they have a greater sense of community, community that we wouldn't otherwise have. Finally, thank you to today's sponsor, Eris. Last week, Eris introduced a state-of-the-art report offering platform for technical and non-technical -tech document creation called Scriva. Eris is offering a closer look at Scriva virtually on Thursday, June 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can learn more about that or to register for the webinar by using uh, erisinfo.com slash Scriva. There is a link that has just been dropped into the chat. Um, I believe you can go there for the demo as well. If you follow actual media at the top of your screen, you'll automatically get a notification for the latest information on upcoming webinars. Until then, thank you again, stay safe, and we will see you next time.